Hey Propel, it's here. Today is the day. Today is, drum roll please. Today is Easter Sunday, so happy Easter Propel. I am so excited to be spending this time with you guys today. Now, I know a lot of you like Easter for probably one reason in particular, the chocolate. Eh, if you're like me, you don't really like chocolate. Maybe you like the eggs or the Easter bunny or the other little goodies you get in your Easter baskets on Easter. But the thing about it is, I know all of those things are really cool, but we gotta remember the real we reason why we celebrate Easter. You see, Easter is the time where we celebrate the biggest, coolest, craziest, most amazing thing that has ever happened on this earth. Easter is the time that we celebrate the fact that Jesus didn't stay dead, but he rose again. And I know, that's pretty crazy. How can someone who was dead come alive again? I know it sounds weird, but the thing is, that's what Jesus does. He turns everything upside down. He changes everything, and he changed everything for us because he loved us so much. You see, Easter is the number one example of how much God loves us, but it isn't the only example. You see, Jesus lived his whole entire life showing love to every single person. He lived the life of humility. He put others' needs before his own. You see, humility is our life app for the series. And don't be confused if you don't really know what humility means, that's okay. Our life app explains that to you. So here it is, let's say on the count of three, ready? One, two, three. Humility is putting others first by giving up what you think you deserve. That's right. You see, that might seem a little upside down. I mean, we normally want what's ours. We want things to go our way. But you see, with God's help, we can turn things upside down. We can live with humility. We can put others' needs before our own, just like Jesus did. You see, through Jesus' example, we have been shown how to live a humble life. And we can find an example of that in the Bible. There are so many verses in the Bible about how Jesus lived humbly and how we too can show humility. And one of my favorite verses is Philippians 2.3. Let's check it out. Philippians 2.3 says, Don't do anything only to get ahead. Don't do it because you are proud. Instead, be humble. Value others more than yourselves. Philippians 2, double dot three. And that verse is kind of simple. It just says, be humble. Value others more than yourself. And that's what Jesus did. And that's what we need to try to do too. But we're gonna talk about all that later. But for now, I'm going to tell you about some rules to today's game. Who's ready? Okay, so this is what's gonna happen. You're gonna need some sweet little treats called Peeps. Everyone give me a big thumbs up if you love these little things. Yeah? Okay. Now if you don't like Peeps, go ahead and give me a thumbs down because personally for me, I like Peeps and I think our special guests like them too. But before we get to them, here are the rules. So you'll need two colors of peeps, a blue, a pink, whatever kind you got. You'll need some toothpicks, a microwave, and a microwave safe plate. So what you're gonna do, you're gonna separate into two teams and you're gonna give each person on your team a peep. Now, once you have your peeps, you're gonna take your toothpick and kinda give them like a little lightsaber, or like a sword, cause it's a peep jousting match. So once they have their swords, you're going to put them on the plate and set them in the microwave. Now set your microwave to 45 seconds, but you do not want it to go longer than 45 seconds. Trust me. So once you've set your microwave, you will watch as your peep joust. And the winning peep will be the one whose sword touches the other peep first. And to demonstrate the game, we have two special guests who are going to show it to you. So let's take a look.
That was awesome. I hope you enjoyed the game. And if you did get a chance to do it, go ahead and post a photo or a video online and tag hashtag PropelEaster20 so we can see it. But with that being said, I think it's time for praise and worship time. That's right. So today we have two songs for you guys. If you remember the motions, that's great. Go ahead and do them. And if you can't seem to remember, that's okay. Make up some of your own. So let's everyone stand up and get ready to worship Jesus. Come on, one voice, let's sing this out. Jesus, there is nothing like your presence. I will sing of all your goodness, where all my fears fade to praise. Savior, there is nothing like your freedom. Dancing with the hope of heaven, where all my fears fade to praise.
creation Everything we breathe repeat the song All these children Clean hands, pure hearts, good dreams, good God His name is Jesus Sweet wine, oh you hear Wow, you guys sounded great. And I can't wait for the day to come to where we get to come back in here to propel and sing and worship as one. But we know that we can worship God anywhere we are, right? Right. Well, let me say again, guys, Happy Easter. And it's so great to be able to come to you and speak to you on such an amazing day. And I'm sure most of you, you woke up today and you had some candy, maybe an Easter basket. Maybe you even had some peeps in that Easter basket. Well, make sure you save those, right, for the game. And how did you enjoy that peep jousting between the Easter bunnies? It was kind of cool, wasn't it? And I can't wait to see what you guys do with that. But guys, looking at Easter, it's one of those holidays that we tend to take for granted. See, we have our traditions that we do at Easter. You know, maybe you traditionally wake up early to go to church even though you didn't get to today. Or you have an Easter egg hunt following the church service with your family. Or you have that, that big family meal that you may not be able to have, you know, this year. Or, you know, weird traditions for me, for some reason, our family, our tradition at Easter is to pick up KFC fried chicken and have Easter lunch of KFC fried chicken. That happened eight years ago, and we've done it every year since. Why is that a tradition? We don't really know, but that's what it is. And see, many of us might know that Easter celebrates how Jesus died but then rose again, but just because we know what happened and we know how to celebrate, we may not really know why, and so we take it for granted. Why did Jesus do what He did for us, and why do we celebrate as followers of Christ? Why do we celebrate that at Easter? And those are great questions. And the question about Jesus has an answer each and every one of us needs to hear. To help answer that question and those other questions that we looked at, we're, we're going to look at the book of John in the New Testament of the Bible. Now you might recognize the name of John when reading the story of Jesus because his name shows up a whole lot in that story. In fact, John was one of Jesus' closest disciples. And later on, he wrote about his experiences so that people like you and people like me, we would know about who Jesus is and exactly what Jesus did. If you remember, last week we learned about how the religious leaders began plotting against Jesus. And we spoke about one of Jesus' closest followers betraying him. Do any of you remember the name of that follower? What was the name of the man that betrayed Jesus? That's right, it was Judas, one of his very own disciples. See, Judas got involved with that plot. And the people celebrated the Passover. They celebrated their last meal together, Jesus and his followers. Then they went out to the Mount of Olives, remember, and that's where what? All of it took place. They went and prayed, or Jesus prayed at the Garden of Gethsemane, and that's where he was arrested. But what happened next after he was arrested, after he was betrayed? What came next was about to go from bad to even worse. And this can be found in the book of John, chapter 18, verses 12 through 14. And it says this, Then the group of soldiers, remember the soldiers that came and captured Jesus, their commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They tied him up and they brought him first to Annas. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest at that time. 
Caiaphas had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. Well, Jesus was arrested and he was brought to the Jewish authorities where they would decide what to do with him. And notice that phrase in there. It said, it would be good if one man died for the people. See, they didn't know it yet. But this was why Jesus was there in the first place. This was all part of God's big plan. But I need, I need to stop right there because I'm getting a little ahead of myself. You see, meanwhile, while all of this was going on, Peter, one of Jesus' closest and most trusted disciples, he was also being questioned, but not by the authorities. There was a little servant girl that came up to Peter and asked if he knew Jesus. And we know what Peter did, don't we? Peter denied knowing him. One of Jesus' closest friends was too scared to even be associated with him. It was a very dark time. And then we can look in John chapter 18, verse 19. And it says, Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus. He asked him about his disciples and about his teachings. And then after questioning Jesus, the Jewish leadership sent him to the Roman governor. And his name was Pilate. And Pilate looked at them and told them, You need to judge Jesus for yourself. But these people, these religious leaders, their motivation is in their words to Pilate. And in John chapter 18, verse 31, we can read their words or their thoughts. It said, Pilate said, take him yourselves, judge him by your own law. But we don't have the right to put anyone to death, they complained. Right there in their words, they wanted nothing but death for Jesus. See, for the religious leaders, death was the only acceptable solution to this Jesus problem, as they were calling it. And they needed Pilate to make that happen. They didn't want to make the decision for themselves. So Pilate interrogated, or he questioned Jesus. And it seems he was surprised by what he found out. In fact, afterward, Pilate declared, Pilate said, I find no basis, I find no reason to charge this man. I find nothing that he's done wrong. And multiple times, Pilate tried to give the people a way to let Jesus go. But that's not what they wanted. At the persuading of these leaders, of these religious leaders, they called for Jesus to be killed. And then in John chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, it says, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him whipped. The soldiers twisted thorns together to make a crown. They put it on Jesus' head. and They put a purple robe upon him. It goes on to say, finally Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be nailed to a cross. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. He had to carry his own cross. He went out to a place called the Skull. In the Aramaic language of the time, it was called Golgotha. There they nailed Jesus to the cross. Two other men were crucified with him. One was on each side of him, Jesus, hanging in the middle. You see, all of the trials, all of the plotting, all of the planning was leading up to this moment. Jesus' enemies were finally getting what they wanted. There Jesus was, nailed to a cross. And since Jesus appeared to be defeated, it seemed like everything He had said about Himself, everything He had claimed to be, everything that they thought He was able to do, it all seemed to be a lie. Could anything He said or did be true now? Well, after a while, Jesus breathed His last breath and He died there on the cross. His body was brought down and He was wrapped and placed in the tomb of a man named Joseph of Arimathea. And then the tomb was shut. A large stone was rolled in front of this tomb. And as that tomb was concealed, as that stone shut that tomb up, it also appeared to be the clothes are the end of the hopes and the dreams of all those that followed and all those that believed that Jesus, this man from Nazareth, was actually going to be the Messiah. It seemed like that cannot possibly be true now. See, this was a really dark time for His followers. This was a really dark time for those that believed in Jesus. They were broken and they were saddened because Jesus was dead. Jesus was gone. The religious leaders had had success, and I'm sure they celebrated. But we know the rest of this story, don't we? See, Jesus was buried and in a tomb, but all of a sudden, 
everything turned upside down. And it began with the rolling away of the stone. And in John chapter 20 verse 1 it says, Early on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. It was still dark. She saw that the stone had been moved away from the entrance. Now kids, can you imagine? You go and you think you're going to the graveside of someone you loved and you get there and the grave is open. The, the, the coffin is open and nobody's there. That's what Mary finds. The stone is rolled away and the tomb is empty. And Mary is still unsure. She doesn't know what has happened. But she runs to Peter. She runs to John who both then run to the tomb to see for themselves what Mary was describing to them. And after inspecting the tomb, after looking inside, they ran back to tell the other disciples what they had seen or really what they hadn't seen. But Mary stayed behind, very upset. She didn't understand. And there while she was sitting, she saw two angels in the tomb. But even more miraculous than that, she met a surprise visitor in the garden. And this next part of the story can be found in John chapter 20, verses 14 through 16. It says, Then she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she didn't realize at first that it was Jesus. And he asked her, Woman, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? And she thought he was the gardener. So she said, Sir, did you carry him away? In other words, did you move Jesus' body? Are you the one that got him out of the tomb? She goes on to say, Tell me where you put him. Then I will go and get him. She really meant, I'll go and get his body. And Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him. And then she cried out in the Aramaic language. She said, Rabboni, Rabboni, which means teacher, teacher. She realized at that moment who it was. In that moment, Mary saw Jesus for who He really is. She realized that the same Jesus who was crucified and died upon that cross was buried in the tomb, was now alive, standing before her very eyes. And she knew that He is risen. See, Mary then ran to tell the disciples what she had seen. And that very night, all of them would experience it for themselves as well. In John chapter 20, 19 through 20, it says, On the evening of that first day of the week, the disciples were together. They had locked the doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. They were afraid that now they were going to come for them like they had come for Jesus. And it says, Jesus came in and stood among them. He said, May peace be with you. Then He showed them His hands. And He showed them His side. And the disciples were very happy. I think there was more than just a happiness, right? It says they were very happy when they saw the Lord. You know, for those who were in the crowd that day when Jesus was sentenced to death, many of them wouldn't have thought twice about the way that Jesus was going to be killed. You see, Jesus wasn't the first person to ever die upon a cross. I mean, that was the Romans' way of dealing with rebels and criminals. Anyone that they saw as a threat to the peace of the mighty Roman Empire and if you remember in the story, there were even two criminals, one on the other side of Jesus, correct? And for many in the crowd that day, Jesus was just a guy who got himself caught up in something bad. And this was the way the Romans and the Jewish leaders were going to deal with him. But we know it wasn't as simple as that. See, just like when Jesus stopped Peter in the garden that night from fighting back when he cut off the, the servant's ear, at any time, Jesus could have stopped this from happening. He could have gotten off of that cross. He could have stopped them. At any moment, He could have called down an army of angels to defend Himself. He could have proven His innocence. So why didn't He do that? Why didn't He remove Himself upon that cross? Why didn't He stop what was happening? Because nobody was taking His life. Jesus was giving His life up. And Jesus said those very words earlier in His life. If you look back at John chapter 10, verse 18, Jesus says, Nobody takes my life from me. I give it up myself. But Jesus also said that after he was to give up his life, he would take it back again. He was referring to his resurrection. He was saying, I will rise again. You see, Jesus wasn't a criminal who got caught up on the wrong side of some rebellious plot. He wasn't a liar who finally got trapped in his own lie. He wasn't a criminal at all. Jesus is the Son of God and He came to lay down His life for you and for me 
so that we could be rescued, so that we could have a relationship with His Father in heaven. And because Jesus rose again to new life, we can now have a new life as well. And we can have that new life, kids, parents, we can have that new life by believing in Him, by trusting in Him, by following Him. That's why Jesus came to earth in the first place. That's why Jesus came and He lived a perfect life and He gave Himself up and He died and He rose again. And that is what we are supposed to celebrate on this day. On this wonderful, beautiful Easter day, we celebrate the fact that Jesus died for us, yet rose again. And that is definitely something we should shout about. And definitely something, kids, that we should celebrate with everything that's inside of us. See, when Jesus died on the cross, He paid the price of our sin. And He did it for all of us, for you, for me, for your families, for everyone. He was willing to face death for us. But as we've just read, He couldn't be kept in a tomb. All of the promises in Scripture, everything had led up to this very moment. The moment when Jesus rose out of that grave and He turned the world upside down. Which leads us, kids, to the most important bottom line we will ever have. See, last week we, we had a bottom line that said what? We should put we should put others first. Remember, put others first? Well, this week, listen to this one. Our bottom line is this. Jesus put us first. Jesus put us first. And I want you to say that with me on the count of three. Are you ready? One, two, three. Jesus put us first. I'm going to get Miss Megan and Miss Rebecca back up here and we're going to put some actions to this amazing bottom line for today. Are you kids ready? So as Petey said, today's bottom line is Jesus put us first. So me and Miss Rebecca are going to be doing some motions for you. Ready? So the first one's going to be Jesus. Because like we talked about, when Jesus died on the cross, the soldiers put nails into his hands and into his feet to keep him on the cross. So by doing this, we're pointing to the nail marks in his hand. So this is Jesus. Now for put us, we're going to kind of like move the box. We're going to put the box in front of us. So here we go. We got Jesus, put us, and then last one, super simple, first. Just the one. So let's try that. Ready? Here we go. Jesus, put us First, very good. Now let's try it one more time and try not to look at us this time. Ready? Jesus, put us first. Good job, everyone. Thank you, Miss Rebecca. Good job, Propel. With that being said, let's keep on that thought of humility and we're going to learn so much more about everything we've been learning about being humble, about humility, about Jesus dying on the cross. And we're going to continue all those thoughts as we go into today's so-and-so show. So let's take a look. Hey, John, I've got a question. What is it, Brandon? No, no, I'm asking the question. Fine, say the question. Why do we paint Easter eggs? Because it's easier than wallpapering them. Oh! <laughs> hey, did you hear the one about the lady whose house was infested with Easter eggs? I did, but she's fine now. You don't say. Yeah, she called an exterminator. <laughs> Exterminate! Oh. <laughs> hey, that reminds me. How does the Easter Bunny stay so healthy? I'm guessing a steady diet of fresh greens and vegetables. That and exercise. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey, speaking of the Easter Bunny, do you know how much he gets for every basket he makes? How much? Two points like everyone else. Oh, <laughs> oh boy. I think we're going to have to stop doing this pretty soon. Why, cause the yolks are so bad? Uh, ah. uh, no, I, 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 I'm getting dizzy. I'm, I, we're upside down. Ah. Uh. <sighs> I need air. <sighs> I need air. <sighs> I can't see. <laughs> Gotta wipe off my glasses. <laughs> okay. Ah. Welcome to the So and So Show. Happy Easter! I thought we were gonna say that together. I'm so sorry. I just got excited. I, I understand. Like it is very exciting. Yo. <laughs> Anywho, 
We're excited because it's time for our annual Easter egg hunt. John and Brandon's annual Easter egg hunt. That's what I said. Every year, we hide one Easter egg somewhere in the world for someone to find. Mm -hmm. Seems impossible, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, it is. No one has ever found the egg we've hidden. So this year, we tried to find someone so cunning, mm. so clever, mm. and so gifted at locating hidden objects, there was no chance they would fail. So please welcome someone who finds stuff. Greetings and saturations. I think you mean salutations. No, I wish. I'm sweating like a long-tailed cat in a room full of rocking chairs. <laughs> it's hotter than the sun out here. Uh, why don't you tell everyone who you are? Oh, uh, my name is Leonard Fortescue, and I am a professional metal detectorist. But presently, I am a professional egg hunter. Oh, did you did you solve our last clue, Leonard? Oh, well, let's see here. <clears throat> <clears throat> We're four-sided and stand very tall, perched in sand with no water at all. The tallest of us has been called great. Most think there's three, but there's really closer to 80 thereabouts. Kind of loses the rhyme a bit at the end. Poetry is hard. Yeah. What do you think, Leonard? Where are you now? Well, Four-sided, tall buildings in the sand? <laughs> I mean, where else would I be? <laughs> All right, yes, well done, Leonard. Did you find our next clue? Mm -hmm. oh, you bet your gumdrops I did. <laughs> Old Camilla here, <laughs> she found it buried in the sand right over there, hang on. <clears throat> I share a name with this very day. If you hope to find me, I'm far out of the way. I sit all alone in a watery bed. I have no body, so look for the part of the body that typically sits on top. Why not just say the head? They didn't want to make it too easy. It's the world's biggest head of lettuce. <laughs> or maybe a giant wheel of head cheese. That's delicious. I don't think it's pretty straightforward. I, oh, and you better hurry. Your time's almost up. Mm -hmm. Oh, sweet petunias. I got to get out of here. Uh, once I find my camel. Hey, Billy Bob! Right, this could take a while. I agree completely. Mm -hmm. That's why we're gonna play a little game I call Egg Smash. In front of us is a basket of a dozen beautifully dyed Easter eggs. We will each take turns smashing an egg on our own heads. How is this a game? It's a game of chance, my friend. Nine of these eggs are filled with confetti. The other three, are raw. Oh. The first person to crack two raw eggs on their head loses. You got it? I got it. After you. Thanks so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay. Ooh. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice! Ow. Confetti and pain. Woo. Your Man. turn. Oh, great. What do you got? What do you got? Oh! oh! It's a party! Here's Here's a party. Good. Oh, hey! Oh. Nice! Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> there we go. Red. Ooh. Whoa! What? I'm getting nervous. There's three yolks here. I know. <laughs> three and three and seven. What's it gonna be? Okay. Yeah. Oh! <laughs> I think that's a strike one. How's that, is, that feel? That's great. That's all, right, great. all right, here we go. My turn. <laughs> Oh! oh. <laughs> right, here we go. Ready? Here we go. Oh! <laughs> I think we have a winner. It's me. Boom! <laughs> I'm getting closer to your egg. I can almost taste it. I can taste it. I figured it out. I'm on Easter Island. <laughs> Look at that big head. Reminds me of my mama. You got there fast. Thank you. I did have a little problem in customs. They apparently don't like you to bring camels onto the island for some reason. Why did you bring... You know what, never mind. Did, did you find the last clue? Does a one-legged dog swim in a circle? <laughs> <clears throat> the last place to go is where you already know. Two sit here on their keister, 
hurry up so we can celebrate Resurrection Day together. You've got egg on your face. Huh. <laughs> oh! Oh, I see what you did there. <laughs> this is the oldest trick in the treasure hunting book. <laughs> Watch out, egg. I'm coming for you. <laughs> uh, that way. <laughs> it's Bible story time with Kellen. Happy Easter, guys. Happy, Happy Easter, Easter, Kellen. Today we're talking about the most amazing moment in history. Want to help me out? Yeah. You bet. Then bring on out the sound jars. Whoa. These jars contain sounds that will help tell the story. All you have to do is open the right jar at the right time. You think you can handle that? <laughs> yeah. Does this answer your question? <laughs> no, it does not. We're ready, Kellen. Perfect. Then here it is, the story of Easter. Jesus was the son of God. Jesus first came on the scene as a baby, born in Bethlehem. <laughs> Jesus grew up. He grew wiser and stronger. Now, as a man, he devoted his life to teaching and serving people. They came in droves to hear his words and see his miracles. Ooh. But ah. even though Jesus had done nothing wrong, many of the religious leaders wanted to get rid of him. So they had Jesus arrested. They tied him up, and he was taken to the high priest. Two of Jesus' disciples, Peter and John, followed at a distance, trying not to draw attention to themselves. But someone recognized Peter. You aren't one of Jesus' disciples, are you? Me? No, not me. Then someone else thought they recognized Peter. Aren't you one of Jesus' followers? No, you're mistaken. And then a third person. Haven't you been with Jesus? I'm telling you for the last time, I don't know him. Later, Jesus was taken to the Roman governor, Pilate, who decided, I, I find no basis for any charge against the man. But the religious leaders stirred up the angry crowd. Fearing a riot, Pilate handed Jesus over to the soldiers. They forced Jesus to drag the heavy beams of a wooden cross to the place where he would be crucified. The place called Golgotha, or the skull. There, they nailed Jesus to the cross. They raised the cross up, and Jesus hung there until he died. It is finished. That evening, Jesus' body was taken down from the cross and put into a cave-like tomb. A heavy, large stone was rolled over to block the entrance. It seemed like the end. All hope was lost. But the story wasn't over yet. Early Sunday morning, when it was still dark, a woman named Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. What she saw astonished her. That large, heavy stone that had blocked the tomb's entrance had been rolled away and Jesus' body was nowhere to be found. So Mary ran. She ran to tell Peter and John what she had discovered. They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. Now it was their turn to run. They ran straight to the tomb, and Mary was right. The cloth used to wrap Jesus' body was still there, but Jesus, well, he was gone. They didn't understand what was happening, so they went back to where they were staying and left Mary there alone. She stood there and cried. But she had to see for herself one more time. So she peeked into the tomb and she saw two angels sitting where Jesus' body had been. They said, Why, Why are you crying? crying? They have taken my Lord away. I don't know where they have put him. Mary turned to find a man behind her. She thought it was the gardener. Sir, did you carry him away? Tell me where you put him, then I will go and get him. Mary. When he said her name, Mary recognized the man. It was Jesus. He was alive. Go to those who believe in me. 
Tell them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary ran to deliver the news. I have seen the Lord. Jesus, God's son, died on a cross. Not because he had no choice. He chose to sacrifice himself to pay for our sins. He put us first in the most ultimate way. And on the third day, Jesus came back to life, proving that God is more powerful than death itself. And that is the story of Easter. Wow, I never get tired of hearing that story. Thanks, Kellen. And I never get tired of talking about the lengths God will go to to show how much he loves us. Happy Easter, Kellen. Happy Easter to you guys. Happy Easter, Brandon. Happy Easter, John. Yeah. Hey, reveal, reveal the question. question. Hey, what does Easter mean to you? Yeah. What do you love about Easter? How does it make you feel when you think about it? Talk about it together, and we'll see you next time. Wait, 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 wait. What about Leonard? Shouldn't we check in to see if he's found the hidden egg? Oh, yeah, I forgot about him. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure he'll find it. That's uh, what, it's yeah. what he does, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's all for the so-and-so show. Happy, Happy Easter! Easter! Here, Norwegian bunny's eyes. <laughs> I'm gonna go make me an orange omelet. <laughs> oh, got my egg. Thanks, guys. And kids, listen, we're talking today about the fact that Jesus came to be our Savior. And if we believe and we put our trust in Him, we can have a relationship with His Father, with God, that will last forever. This costs Jesus everything. It costs Jesus everything to put us first. You see, Jesus died so He could pay the price for our sins, so that we could be forgiven. And because we're forgiven, that's the only way we can have a relationship with God. And because of what Jesus did on the cross, we can have a relationship with God that lasts forever. Everything that had happened before was leading up to this moment. It was like sin had built a wall between us and God. Something that stood between us and God. But when Jesus paid the price on the cross, when He paid the price for that sin, He tore down that wall. He made a way for us to go through, made a way for us to become part of God's family. And then when Jesus came back to life, he proved once and for all that he was more powerful than death. He proved that he was and that he is the Son of God and he is our Savior. Today, some of you have already put your faith in Jesus. You've already decided and you believe and you know that this is true. We celebrate with you. Some of you may be watching today and you're still thinking about it. I want you to know that you can have a relationship with Jesus too. So right now, wherever you are, I want you to search your heart. Have you given your life to Jesus? Have you asked Him to come into your heart and to forgive you of your sins? If not, I want you to pray with me in just a second. Now, if you're watching and you have asked Jesus into your life, then while we pray, thank Him for His gift to you. Thank Him for what He's done for you. Thank Him for that gift of His death, but also for the fact that He rose again. Amen? Amen? Let us pray. God, I know that we don't really have the words to say how thankful we are for what you've done for us. Jesus, we can't put into words how thankful we are for what you did for each and every one of us when you died upon that cross. Jesus, I'm going to do my best to just say thank you. Thank you for the death that you gave. Thank you for putting yourself in that place so that I don't have to die, that I can have eternal life. God, you are the creator of the universe. And Jesus, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Yet you loved us so much that you put yourself there. You didn't have to die. You could have stopped it. Yet you allowed yourself to be put there. 
You put me first. You loved me. You loved all of us enough to take that on. Thank you so much for that. I thank you, Lord, that I can stand here today saved and set free. I thank you, Lord, for those that are watching and those that are listening today that can have the confidence and know that you are who you said you are. You are the Son of God. You died and rose again. You are the way maker. That you make the way for us to have that relationship with the Father. So I rejoice and I celebrate with those that know that in their heart today. But Father, I also know that there are some watching, maybe some parents, maybe some children, maybe a brother or a sister, that Lord, they don't know you this way. So Father, I pray right now that they will search their heart. And God, that in this moment, they will turn their life over to you. And all they have to do is say, Jesus, I believe that you died for me. Jesus, I believe in all that you said you were, you are. I believe it, Father. And I admit that I am a sinner. And I know that I need a Savior. And I'm confessing those things to you right now, Father. So please, enter into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Let me live for you. And Father, when they say these things, let them be confident in what you've done for them. And today, Lord, we celebrate. We celebrate what you've done for us. We thank you for your death. And we celebrate the new life that you have and the new life you've given us. In your wonderful, mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen, kids. Let's all celebrate what Jesus has done for us today. Happy Easter, guys. Thanks, Petey. Remember, kids, when we practice humility and put others first, it might cost us everything, right? You see, when we have to be patient, it might cost us some time. Or we might have to give up something we really want in order to help someone else. You see, in Jesus' case of putting others before himself, he gave up everything. It cost him his whole entire life. And amazingly, he did that all for us. You see, Jesus died on the cross so we could be forgiven of our sins and so we could have a relationship with him. You see, sin separates us from God. And sin is the wrong things we think, we say, and we do. And because of sin, like I said before, we're separated from God. But God sent Jesus as a baby to be born in that manger, to grow up, to do amazing things, and then to die on a cross, but not stay dead, to rise again. And He did that just for us so we could have that relationship with Him. And because of what Jesus did, He's made the one and only way for us to be able to have that relationship with God. And all we have to do is just ask Jesus to come into our heart and to save us and to help us to live for Him all the days of our lives. And then one day when we die, we'll be able to go to heaven to be with Jesus forever and ever and ever. And it's as simple as that. So I'm really glad Jesus didn't stay dead. He's alive. And that's amazing. The empty tomb is the perfect reminder of our basic truth that we can trust God no matter what. Our bottom line says that Jesus put us first. And he turned the whole world upside down by what he did. And he can turn things around for you too. So as we end our time here today, I want y'all to think about the question the so-and-so show asked us. That question was, what does Easter mean to you? I hope today you've learned that Easter isn't just about the bunny or eggs or candy. That Easter is about so much more than that. Easter is a celebration that our King, our Savior, Jesus Christ, He isn't dead in that tomb. That He's alive and He is well and He is in heaven waiting for us. So with that being said, I have a challenge for you guys today. I want you to find someone. It could be your parents, your siblings, your aunt, your uncle, your grandparents, even your cat. Whoever you want to find, I want you to go up to them and tell them that Jesus is alive. Okay, can you do that for me? Jesus is alive. And I want you to tell them that. And I want you to be able to tell them the story of Easter that we learned here today. So with that being said, if you ask Jesus into your heart while PD was praying, I want you to get your parent to let us know because we would love to celebrate with you and welcome to the family of God. And we'd also like to talk with you and to help you grow your relationship with Jesus more. 
I hope you enjoyed today's lesson and I hope you guys have a very happy Easter and I hope you guys join us next week as we continue our series Upside Down. So until then, remember, Jesus is alive and I'll see you next week, Propel. Just want to say thank you again, guys, for checking out the Propel service this week. We hope that you all enjoyed it. We hope that you have a blessed Easter. Don't forget, parents, as soon as this is over, make sure you download the activity guides that go along with this. If you have a preschooler, we have the Propel Junior service just for them that you can watch and also an activity guide with them. Because it's Easter, we want to do something a little extra. So along with the two activity guides for both age groups, we have something called Easter Jam. As part of that, there's two activities, two games that are made for your entire family to enjoy during this time. Part of that, or one of those games, is the peep jousting, so all the instructions are there. If you will, post pictures, videos of you playing the games. We'd love to see it. Again, stay tuned for more to come, and we love you guys, and we'll see you soon. The fruit of the spirit's not a coconut. Fruit of the spirit's not a coconut. If you want to be a coconut, you might as well hear it, you can't be a fruit of the spirit Cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control Oh, the fruit of the spirit's not a banana The fruit of the spirit's not a banana You wanna be a banana? You might as well hear it, you can't be a fruit of the spirit Cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control Love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Oh, the fruit of the spirit's not a watermelon. The fruit of the spirit's not a watermelon. If you wanna be a watermelon, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit, cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Love and joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Oh, the fruit of the spirit's not a lemon. The fruit of the spirit's not a lemon. If you wanna be a lemon, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit, cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Oh, the fruit of the spirit's not a cherry. The fruit of the spirit's not a cherry. If you wanna be a cherry, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit, cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Okay, everybody knows that grapes come in bunches, so everybody get in big bunches. The fruit of the spirit's not a grape. The fruit of the spirit's not a grape. You wanna be a grape? You might as well hear it, you can't be a fruit of the spirit Cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control